RMS Titanic, a ship known for many things, one of which was her massive size. And although Titanic is, by today's standards, not a particularly large ship in most rights, she was still gigantic and, in fact, the largest ship ever built, albeit narrowly, at the time of her completion. Specifically, Titanic was 46,000 gross register tons and change, 92 and a half feet wide at her beam, and, maybe most relevant to this video, 882 feet 9 inches long. That's length overall for the pedantics in the audience. A ship of that size traversing any body of water, let alone the harsh waters of the North Atlantic, was bound to undergo a lot of stress. Throughout most of the ship, this stress was handled by the sheer strength of her steel-framed hull, but a significant portion of Titanic wasn't designed to provide structural strength to the ship. In fact, the structural part of the ship only rose as high as B-deck. That's all the way down here. Everything above B-deck is what is often called the ship's superstructure. I'm not actually sure that superstructure precisely refers to everything above the structure of the hull girder, but I'll let the naval architects and engineers let me know in the comments. Anyway, everything above B-deck essentially sits on top of the hull, and only needs to support itself and any forces applied directly to it. However, the superstructure is still attached firmly to the hull, and is therefore going to experience stress as the ship crosses rough oceans. Let's quickly go over the primary stresses that the ship endures while at sea. The first two are hogging and sagging, which many of you watching are likely familiar with. Hogging is when the middle of the ship is supported by the ocean, but the bow and stern are not supported because they are within the trough of a wave. Sagging is the opposite, when the bow and stern are supported by the wave, but the middle of the ship is not. The other two primary stressors are called racking and torsional stress, and are less commonly discussed but are still important. Racking occurs when a ship is rolling from side to side, resulting in the distortion of the ship in such a way that it is less perpendicular to the deck. Torsional stress is the twisting of the structure of the ship along the longitudinal axis. Hogging and sagging are probably easier to understand and explain, and if you understand those, then you'll understand the reason for the expansion joints, which is the subject of the rest of this video. Titanic superstructure, like the rest of the ship, needed to withstand these forces. But the superstructure wasn't nearly as strong as the hull. To make the superstructure that strong would have been impractical, expensive, and possibly less effective than the solution that her builders, and the builders of other large ships, employed. Expansion joints. The expansion joints found on Titanic are not unlike those you would find on a vehicle bridge today, although the forces applied to a ship are different from those applied to a bridge. Fundamentally, expansion joints are, well, joints, in the superstructure of a ship, which actually divide the superstructure into separate sections which can move independently from one another. Such a separation allows the larger superstructure to move when force is applied to it, as opposed to absorbing the stress as the hull does. But how can you have multiple expanding and contracting gaps on a ship, especially on a ship with pesky passengers wandering about? Well, for one, the joints between the sections of the superstructure actually aren't that large. You might have noticed that ships don't wiggle around like limp noodles when they're underway. They are quite strong and rigid, at least to the naked eye. But although the flexing might be hard to discern to onlookers, the ship, if it were alive, would certainly feel the stress. Olympic and Titanic each had two expansion joints, both starting at B deck and rising up to the boat deck. The forward expansion joint was between the first and second funnels, closer to the forward funnel, and the second was between the third and fourth funnels, again closer to the forward funnel. Both of these expansion joints would have been visible to passengers and were likely even noticed, though not dwelled on, by most who crossed them. Passengers wouldn't have seen the actual gap that constituted the expansion joint. Instead, they would have seen a brass plate stretching laterally across the deck, creating a slight bump for them as they strolled the promenade deck, chatting and admiring the ocean. The brass plate, of course, was there to cover the spaces between the three sections of superstructure and, crucially, protect passengers and crew from tripping, twisting ankles, or being separated from their fragile limbs. The brass plates were fastened only to the forward side of each expansion joint, so that the plate could freely slide as the two superstructure sections moved relative to one another. The plate, though, was large enough to always cover the space between the two sections. In places where the expansion joint reached the deck at an inaccessible part of the ship, 
There was no breastplate, since there would be nobody around to be injured by the flexing of the ship. You might be wondering how the builders stopped water from coming into the ship through the expansion joints, since the moving breastplate was obviously not watertight. After all, the expansion joints were present on A deck and the boat deck, which were exposed to the weather in many places. Well, the solution was quite simple. Leather. Thick leather strips, about 3 eighths of an inch, were attached to both the forward and after edges of the expansion joint. The leather was waterproof and wide enough so that it would never be pulled taut by the flexing of the ship. Actually, enough excess leather was used so that it sagged in the middle and acted as a gutter for any water that did get in. The leather gutter then guided the water toward the scuppers at the sides of the ship, and thus overboard when it reached the scupper openings on B deck. But the expansion joints didn't only intersect horizontal surfaces like the decks. They also separated the vertical walls within the superstructure and the bulwarks on the sides of the ship. These vertical surfaces were not covered with a brass plate, but only a leather strip, since it's difficult to trip on a wall. If you like this video, please remember to like and subscribe if you haven't already, to help with the algorithm. I also want to know what other topics you would like me to cover in the future. As you might know, I no longer upload videos on a set schedule, so I want to make sure that every topic I choose is interesting both to me and to you. Lately, I've been interested in learning more about the technical workings of ocean liners, such as the expansion joints we discussed in this video. But I'm fascinated by all things pertaining to ships, so if you want to learn about something more historical, for example, let me know in the comments. Until next time, take care, and thank you for watching.